So my name's Pam Alden, and I have been coming to Green here for, actually Green um, Church for a couple years now. My life has not been simple. Uh, I have been sexually abused, I was physically abused, and emotionally abused. I have been through financial burdens, some pretty bad, including in that some physical ailments, um, cancer, diabetes, and about six years ago, um, God led us to come up here to Oregon from California. At that point in my life, I was pretty depressed. Um, I've had clinical depression for years, was diagnosed in my early 30s, and been struggling with that and anxiety for a long time. By the time we got up here to Oregon, um, I was pretty down. And to leave a town that we lived in for 35 years and leaving a lot of friends and family um, was pretty challenging for me. And um, last year, um, about this time last year in August, my uh, brother and closest sibling was murdered. And the same week I lost a girlfriend to suicide and a month before one of my closest friends growing up. And I got to the point where I had just given up on life. I was suicidal. Um, I didn't care about living anymore. I, I couldn't imagine going on any further. Um, it just seemed like everything in my life just kept getting worse and worse and more challenging. And at one point when we came to Green, um, Renee Kripe actually started talking to me about restoration. I thought, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm ready for this, and, and I really didn't want to talk to anybody yet, and I was just kind of down, but at some point I finally realized um, God's kind of leading me there, and so I took restoration class. It was amazing. Um, through restoration, I learned that my perspective on God was completely skewed. Um, I thought of God as mostly angry, often at me, um, vengeful, and very scary. And uh, I discovered that God really is loving and kind and amazing, and He loves me as His daughter, you know, and that just um, made a huge difference. I also realized that a lot of my hurt and a lot of pain was coming from the enemy. Um, I never really talked about that before uh, with anybody, and I discovered you know, that the enemy's out there and he just kept trying to attack me and attack me. And so through restoration, I learned that I have power over that. I learned to have tools to take my thoughts captive and to put on my armor of God every day and to be protected by God. Um, I learned that I can lean on him at any time. And the change in me has been amazing. I mean, I was so just held captive by these strongholds of guilt and shame and and fear and anxiety and I just feel like there's a sense of freedom now my chains have been broken I feel like I'm a whole new person and it's just been amazing and incredible and I just I can't tell you how much that means to me to actually have life back um, to have hope back I feel like that's one thing I lost was complete faith in God and my hope. I had none. Um, and now I have a reason to live. I have hope. I have all of that back again. And I'm a much joyful and much more amazing person. And the best thing is other people are noticing. And I'm able to turn them around and point them right back to God and thank Him for doing this for me. Wow, huh? What'd you hear in that story? I, we so appreciate Pam for sharing her story with us. When I listened to that for the first time, I thought, that's a lot of stuff for one person to experience. And if you were to say, here's the biography of this person, what kind of a person would you expect? Somebody who's broken and resentful and hurting and, you know, the relationships are all in chaos. And the beautiful thing is, Pam is not only serving, and she, I love that line, I got my life back and I got my, my hope back. And she's actually now volunteering to go help with our new campus in Myrtle Creek because God is using her and she has purpose again in life. And we're, we're using this imagery uh, of the Japanese art of kintsuki to talk about how all of us are broken, 
And the church is not supposed to be a museum where you come and show off how good you are. It's supposed to be a hospital where people come to get fixed and healed. And when we, we see the, the cracks of our life, not as something that's shameful that we have to hide, but when we see that when we turn it over to God, he gives us gold where the cracks have been. Then it makes us more interesting. It makes us actually moves us ahead. God never takes you back to where you used to be. He takes you ahead to somewhere better. And hopefully we're a church where you can share your story and you can talk about your struggles and you can say things like, I have done X, whatever that was, and not be judged and not be condemned. Because everyone is broken. I want to give you a couple of vocabulary words as we walk through this, as we talk about the deep, the depth of our broken nature. And the whole picture here of everyone is broken. I know that there are two groups and and two goals that I would have for you. One is, if you heard Pam's story, I hope those of you who say, well, I am so broken, I could never really be healed. That could never be my story. That you would begin to have faith and trust that God can make your life like the life we just heard. There's a second group, and my second goal is, I know that there are some people, when we put out that title, everyone is broken, you thought, no, not me. That's not me, I'm fine. I don't want to talk about brokenness, I don't want to deal with that stuff, I don't want to admit that, it's either I'm denying it or I'm ashamed of it. And I hope by the end of our talk today, you can honestly say, yeah, I am broken, And you can own that because, listen, Jesus said, I can't come to heal people who already think they're well. A physician is only good for somebody who knows they're sick. And until you admit it, you can't find healing. And and last week, as Rachel shared her story, she had this great line. She says, I couldn't be completely healed until I admitted how completely broken I was. And there's some truth to that. So... Broken, we're using the terminology, not that you're as bad as you can be, and believe me, all of us are happy about that, but that you no longer function as originally intended, meaning God has a design and a plan and a goal for us. He has a destiny, and when you're broken and you're trying to do it on your own, you can't fulfill that destiny. And then there's a a couple of other words that if you're fairly new to Bible study or maybe new to church, you're not familiar with. They sound like big church words, but they're really important in our understanding, especially of what we're talking about this weekend. And one is justification. And in Colossians chapter three, where we're gonna be, he talks about the beauty of what he's gonna do, but if you backtrack to chapter two, if you have your Bible, I'm gonna be reading out of chapter two, and I'm gonna start in verse 12. He says, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh... You couldn't say anything nastier to a Jewish person. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So when you come to faith in Christ, when you begin to believe that the the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the center point of history and, and that is the solution for the deepest problem we have, which is our sin. You are justified. Easy way to remember that is it's just as if I'd never sinned. And God makes you completely holy. And, and if you like, we use words like getting saved or getting born again. And this, this is the moment of faith commitment. And listen to this. You will never be more forgiven than you are at that second. It's not about you working hard then to deserve God's forgiveness. But then there's a whole second part of that, and that's sanctification, which is God beginning to change by his transforming power, your heart, your attitude, your thoughts, your behaviors. And that's the part we're talking about is the first part, if you will liken it to a pot that's broken, the first part is you bring all the broken pieces and you say, okay, Jesus, here I am. And you put yourself in the potter's hands. You put yourself in the hands of the craftsman. The second part is the long-term process that God does to help us identify where we're broken and then put the glue on and then put the gold on the top of it. And we are using that imagery of kintsuki, which is acknowledging that we are broken. And there is the 
Japanese art that actually started back when a, a shogun hated the way they fixed his tea bowl with staples, and he sent it to some craftsmen, and they, they repaired it with gold. And we're talking about that process that as I acknowledge my brokenness, and aren't you glad that God doesn't show us all of our brokenness all at once? Man, you'd just kind of like be a grease spot right there, you know, to, to be totally overwhelming. But God gently works with us. In fact, sanctification is a great picture for pottery because it means being washed and made clean and ready for use or healed and fixed and ready for use. And, and the interesting part about Kintsuki is that this plate, with all its cracks and with the gold that shines through, is more interesting than it was originally. It's stronger. It's more beautiful. It's now a work of a craftsman, not just one of a thousand plates. And if you can begin to see that, that God has taken your life and you have a unique brokenness, and usually there's layers of brokenness, And as God heals you and as God brings out the gold, you become an exhibit of his masterwork. And nobody else is quite like you. Pam tells us her story. She's got a very unique story. You have exactly a unique story as well. And God wants to heal us and he wants to transform that brokenness into a thing of beauty. And so let's start through that process. And as I said, the goals are I want you to see how God can make it beautiful, but that we have to admit that we're broken. That humility is the step before the beauty. And so in Colossians chapter 3, which is an awesome chapter, I hope you read it and are familiar with it because it's one of my favorites. But he says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You see, he starts sketching for us the beauty of what God is going to do and what God has done. And he starts with the statement of what God has already done. He says, for you are raised with Christ. For you are, you died and your life is hidden with Christ. And then he says, when Christ, who is your life. See, that's the part that God has done. He has already changed us until we are, in fact, when we baptize people, we're having a baptism today, and and when we put people under the water, we quote a little piece from Romans chapter 6, which says, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to live a new life. And the picture there is not just that we're forsaking our sins and saying, okay, God, I'm sorry for all that awful stuff. You're actually letting go of your control, you're letting go of your plans and your dreams, and you're saying, I'm coming back up, and we're starting life over. So at that point, he says, you have a new identity. And uh, one of the books that I would encourage you as you're working through this process is there's a Neil Anderson book called Bondage Breaker, and he's got a whole chapter in here about how we tend to see ourselves based on what our parents said and what others say and our own failures and our own you know, negative self-talk. And then he talks about what God says about us. That if I am in Christ, I'm a child of the King. I am redeemed. I am set apart for a unique purpose. I'm headed towards heaven. And it's not just that you now have a get out of hell free card. It is that God has come and he's living in you and he wants to live his life through you. And so there's a powerful chapter in there about what our identity is. And you see, your behavior always shows who you really think you are. Because you say, well, this is like me and this isn't like me. And so we can't just be changing our behavior. In fact, part of the problem is we often think that justification is done by faith in God. He's the only one that can save us. But then somehow when it comes to fixing our lives and changing our behavior, we think it's all up to us. And let me tell you very clearly, You can no more fix yourself than you could save yourself. You begin by faith. You don't continue by works. You begin by faith, and you continue by faith. Because God is the only one who can put the gold in. God is the only one who can repair. You ever see a a clay pot that could fix itself? It's hopeless, and yet we try. And sometimes we are shamed. But he says, I want you to know who you are, 
Because when you know who you are, then you'll behave differently. And you know, this has always been God's heart all the way through the scriptures. And as I was thinking about this, I, I was reminded of a passage of scripture that you may be familiar with because it's in a lot of songs. And it's, it's Isaiah chapter 61. And Isaiah was writing about 600 years before Jesus. And he is pointing to when Jesus is going to come and what he's going to do. And in fact, in Mark, or Luke chapter 4, Jesus stands in his own synagogue in his hometown and they hand him a scroll and he opens up Isaiah 61 and then he says, and today this is fulfilled. Yes, I know this is about me. Look, look at what God's heart is. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Isn't that a great picture of God? To, to put the gold in the cracks to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Don't you love that, that imagery? The oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of... His splendor. You see, it's always been God's heart to bring beauty for ashes. We have to come to the place where we're willing to turn over the ashes, to admit that we are in despair, to understand that we are in mourning. But God says, that's always been my heart. And Jesus said, that's exactly what I came to do. That based on your new identity, I want to give you new behaviors and new thoughts and new actions. That there's going to be a new normal as you grow. And that normal is going to happen by faith, not by works. You see what he says? He says, since you know who you are, since you've been raised with Christ, now here's your job. Set your heart, set your mind. In fact, if you look at some different translations, it says, seek the things, set your minds in the ESV. Set your sights, think about heaven and the new living. Set your affections, the King James says. So he says, since this is who you are in the depths of your being, now that you're a follower of Jesus, every single day, you need to take that surrender and say, okay, God, because you know, when you wake up, what are you thinking about when you wake up? Killing the alarm clock. I have to get up. I have to do these things. Oh, my aching back. Oh, I shouldn't have done what, oh man, what I said yesterday. What I need to do today, what are our thoughts on? <laughs> right here, right now. They're on earth, aren't they? And I hope you've made a practice in your life of, of starting every morning by, by opening the scriptures, by praying, by getting your head straight. Because frankly, until you're really one in the spirit, you're a dangerous person. So he says, I want you to set yourself what, what we use in our imagery today is every day you need to take those broken pieces and put them back in the hands of the craftsman and say, okay, God, I'm yours today. What's our plan? What's your plan for me? He says, set your minds on things above. This world is passing. It's going to be gone. You need to set our minds on what is going to be eternal, what's going to be renewing us daily. And as you do that every day, God begins to transform you. It doesn't happen all at once. And, and it doesn't mean that it will all be easy. Because sometimes God has to allow some crashing in our life so that the cracks are revealed. Because that's when he can heal them. And we often think, well, if I follow God, then everything will go smoothly. And I think, where in the Bible do you find that? And what character in scripture shows that? None of them, do it. So, so God's plan is for us is he says, I want to set you free. I want to renew you. And I was, I was talking to Shauna Murphy, who is our renewal director, and she heads the programs. We, we put them uh, in the program last week, all the renewal ministries, which help people with broken marriages and grief after losses and post-abortion healing. And, and we've talked about all of these places where we need renewal. And I said to her, what's your vision as the renewal director? What do you hope happens in people's lives? And man, she sought me back a text and she said, you know, I hope that those who are broken are restored. 
I hope those who are in bondage and addiction and caught, I hope they are set free. I hope those who are alone feel connected. I hope those who feel unworthy come to see that they're treasured. I hope those who are just surviving begin to thrive. I hope those who are hopeless become purposeful and those who are drowning feel held. Isn't that a great word? Feel held. And those who are stuck start taking steps. Isn't that a powerful picture of the beauty that God can bring? That those who are in all of these cases, that God can move us towards that beautiful restoration. Do you believe God can do that? That's absolutely his desire and his plan. And I would ask you, be honest with yourself. If this is a one and this is a 10, where are you in your process of being restored? Are you at the two and a half, just barely getting started? Do you say, I'm, in some areas, I think I'm at an eight or a nine. I, I feel free. I, I can say with Pam, I got my hope back. Where are you in this personal process? Because every one of our journeys is a bit different. And you can make progress in some places and still be stuck in others. And you see, the most important part of as we go through this series is for you to identify what God needs to do in you and where he needs to heal and for you to take those things and to to surrender them to him. That we would love to see you looking like this, every one of you. And, And again, the reminder, we can't do it ourselves. You can't fix yourselves, but you can fix your eyes. In other words, part of this is God's job, and only he can do it, but it, we can't just sit in the lazy boy and say, okay, God, transform me, and please make it not hurt. <laughs> no, God says you have to surrender yourself daily, and you have to acknowledge your brokenness, and you have to trust your hand, yourself to the hands of the master craftsman, and if you do that, then God will heal us and make it beautiful. And I love this Kintsuki idea because when people are healed, you know what happens? The, the, the memories are there, the facts are still there, but the heat is gone. The losses are still there, but the, the destruction is gone. And you see, so many people don't want to feel the hurt, so they try to numb themselves by drugs and alcohol, or by busyness, or by relationships, or by possessions. They're just trying to run around, trying to ignore, and trying to numb it. And God says, oh, I want to transform it. I want to make it beautiful. I want to change your life. And we have to believe that that is God's goal, and that that's what he can do. And you know, the other thing I notice is when people are actually healed, they're no longer ashamed of it. In fact, they want to help other people. Somebody told me after the message last night, they sent me an awesome text. They said, you know, when you're in the ditch, you don't want help from somebody who's never been in the ditch. And you can't get help from somebody who's in the ditch with you. You need somebody who's been in the ditch and is now out. He says, we need to become doctors of the ditch. Isn't that great? Yeah, I steal everybody's stuff. It's great. (laughs) So how does that happen? It starts with us acknowledging our brokenness. Looking inside and saying, oh, that's as ugly in me as it is when I see it in somebody else. So let me read you what Paul goes on to say in chapter three. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Whoa. You're just talking about beauty and wonder, and now you're getting ugly. He says, isn't it amazing? We can read this 2,000-year-old list, and it's like tomorrow's newspaper. It's exactly what we go through, isn't it? He says, write this on your outline. Kill your sin, or it will kill you. He says, I want you to get serious about this. Part of our brokenness is that even though Christ has saved us, There is still within us a traitorous sin nature. And he says, you need to look inside and say, what is it you're really battling with? You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self 
which is being renewed. That's the daily part of it, in knowledge and the image of its creator. He says, look inside and see what it is that is broken. Let me give you some things that are broken in us. One is the Bible says we all are born broken. That because of Adam's sin, we all are born with a tendency and an invitation towards sin. If you don't believe that, then let me ask her this. How long did it take your kid to teach your kids how to lie? I mean, you know, you said to them the first time, give me a really big whopper and I'll give you a skittle. And you better do it with a good facial expression so I believe you. How, how long was it before you, told, you taught your kids how to hit other people back? How about not to share? Is that, is that a hard lesson to teach them? You say, oh, this beautiful, perfect, innocent baby. Yeah, the Bible says we are born with original orientation to not follow God, but to do our own thing. And here, it's an important part of your theology to understand that we all have different kinds of original sin. We are not all tempted by the same things, and we do not all have the same problems, but we all have something in common. We're all sinners. And then there's family dysfunction. Was your family dysfunctional? Don't, don't say it out loud if your parents are sitting near you. I remember the first time my brother who was studying counseling, he said to us, Paul, you know, our family was dysfunctional some too. No, it wasn't. We were fine. It was a preacher's family. I was the oldest of this whole band of kids and my parents didn't get divorced and none of us went and got addicted to drugs and we, we had a good family. We did. But you know, he said, Dad was raised in a home where there was an alcoholic who was beat his kids and disappeared for a long time. And my dad did so much better, but there was some of that that leaked through occasionally. And my wife pointed out to me that in our family, we talk about ideas and teaching and thinking. We don't talk about feelings. And of course, I said, why should we? Feelings are unimportant. No, I, I begin to get an instruction level in how important feelings are and how they are real and how they so impact your relationship. And then God gave me three daughters and I had a master's level <laughs> study in why feelings are important. And I said to my mom when we were talking about it, I said, you know, our, our family, my, Rex says that our family has some dysfunction to it. And she said, well, of course it does. No family is perfect. But you know why I have a hard time admitting my family was messed up? Because it means I'm messed up. Right? And if we can't acknowledge it, then you're doomed to repeat it. We need to look back and we need to say, my parents did a good job and I'm glad I had some options that I had, but there were some ways in which I've been bent that are not healthy. And every one of us has to honestly deal with those things. Otherwise, God can't heal us. And then, if you get out of that, we have a tendency to say, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't want to talk about that. Well, somebody said, you know, yeah, you're fine. It stands for freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> so when you say you're fine, <laughs> thank you for the admission. <laughs> And don't we need to redefine fine? Don't we need to say I'm in process and God's working on me and I have a future beauty that he's doing, but right now I got some junk I'm dealing with. I got some brokenness. And then adversity comes into our life. The crashing blows of life and you heard Pam talk about being sexually molested. And, and I can't imagine the impact of that on a whole life. But there's also simple things like your parents die. You go through a loss of a job. You go through financial wreckage. You go through kids growing up and rebelling. You, you go through the wreckage and the difficulty of life. And if you were not broken before, that will break you. And you know what? None of us get out of it without some breakage. In fact, I'll tell you, when you get a blow, it usually breaks along a fault line. Quite often, a crisis comes so you can fix what's already broken. 
and adversity comes and how we respond to grief and how we respond to the difficulties. Either we surrender it to God and let him make the crack heal and put gold there or we try to numb it or we try to pretend it isn't there or we try to somehow do it ourselves. And when you see the level of brokenness, you begin to understand we can't fix it. And then, of course, there, if as though that weren't enough, we have our own sinful choices. Every one of us have done things wrong. And in fact, sometimes we plan to do things wrong. You say, well, people just don't know any better. That's not the problem. Even when we know better, we know here's God's plan and here's my plan. We want to do what's wrong. How many of you enjoy sin? Boy, there's a dangerous question in there. Yeah. Why would we do it if there's not some joy to it? I I heard a sad story this week. He said this kid grew up in a Christian home and homeschooled and had all this sheltered life and then got out on his own and went wild, went off the rails. And somebody asked him later, what was the deal? He said, nobody ever told me sin was fun. (laughs) How can it be tempting if it isn't drawing something inside of us? Let me explain this. This is Pastor Will. (laughs) This is green bean casserole. Put this on full screen in green. I want to I wanna see Will throw up a little bit in his mouth because uh, Will hates green bean casserole. How many of you like green bean casserole? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with green bean casserole, but there's nothing in Will that likes this. He has never been tempted by green bean casserole. So let me, let me break this down for you. If there's not something inside of us that wants to sin, why is it a problem? If there's not something that wants to compare with others, if there's not something that wants to lust after whatever, if there's not something that wants revenge and bitterness and anger, if there's not anything in us, then we would never be tempted by it. This is a donut. (laughs) Will will kill for a donut. He says, you know, even if I know it's going to make me sick afterwards, I still eat it. Isn't that a picture of sin? There's something in us that betrays us. And it says, even if I want to do what's right, even if I know afterwards I will feel bad, there is a battle within. Listen, that's part of our brokenness. It's something that will never be fully healed until heaven, is it? And so we need to acknowledge that that's another part of the brokenness that I face, that God is at work in me, and I need to surrender to him, and that if we come to finally acknowledge that we are broken, there is healing and there is hope. But you know, I know some of us, when we see that title that says everyone is broken, there is still something in us that says No, I'm not. I'm not on that extreme. I haven't gone through all those things. And see, the danger in this series is when we talk about extreme brokenness, people who've gone through very little brokenness, they feel like, this is a me. It's not talking about me. I'm fine. Let me just wade in a little deeper. When you say, I've never been addicted and I've never committed adultery and I have never stolen from anybody and I have never killed anybody and I am a pretty good person. You are at such terrible risk for looking down your nose at everybody who has. You see, one of the ugliest sins and one of the things that people stay away from church because they are afraid of self-righteous judgment. And you see, Those people who say, I'm not broken, you just don't realize that that's the ugliest kind of brokenness as you set yourself up as though you are good. If you ever hear yourself say, those people, you realize that you're judging. Why do you think people are afraid that Christians are going to judge them? Because Christians do. And until you can say that is not okay and the wrath of God is coming on our self-righteous judgments as surely as it's coming on sexual immorality. Because you see, we have ugly sins and polite sins. And all of it is part of what God wants to heal in us. 
And if you see somebody that knows their Bible and they go to church and they do all kinds of good things, but they got this stiff and haughty and arrogant way of talking and way of living, know that they are broken and God has to heal them. And I will tell you, he may have to break them severely first. Because sometimes humility only comes when you finally realize there's no us in them. It's all of us who are struggling. So what are the hope? What are the things that God takes? He takes all those broken pieces and he says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. God says, I can fill in the cracks no matter if your life has been wonderful, if your life has been awful, I can fill in. In fact, I like this picture. I don't know if you remember that brokenness. In fact, the, the pot that we talked about here was so shattered in some places that there wasn't enough to glue together. And in those places, it's all gold. So what does that mean on a daily practical level? It means that there's a battle that goes on. And he says, you need to put off those things. The brokenness that you acknowledge, that you say, I need to put off judgment, or I need to put off lust, or I need to let that secret of that abortion that I had, I need to let that out. I, I need to talk about that divorce, or that theft, or that jail time. I, I need to be open with somebody. He says you need to put off that stuff. And there's, there's a beautiful picture of putting off and putting on. In Ephesians 6, and it's in the devotions that you can read this week, he says... I want you to put on the full, what? Armor. And in this book, he actually walks through and he details what that armor looks like. And there's one particular piece. He says, you put on the shield of faith which extinguishes the fiery arrows. You know, a, a fiery arrow, it's not the hole it leaves, it's the fire it starts. And I hear so many people say, I have this battle in my mind. I obsess about it and I think about it. And sometimes it's about their own unworthiness. Sometimes it's about bitterness of somebody that hurt them. They're, that we get this battle in our heads and you can't get it out of your head. And you know, you can't just say, don't think about the number 13. <laughs> and what happens when you try that? You exactly. It's like wrestling with a tar baby. You just get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier, right? And, and so this picture of just saying put off, he says, no, you have to do the opposite also. You have to put on. And then he goes on and he says, I want you not only to put off all these ugly, sinful things, he says, verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love that binds them together in perfect unity. You see, in Ephesians, he says, the one that's been stealing should steal no longer, but work with his own hands so that he can have something to give. The person who's been judgmental should say, I need to put on compassion. And say, I get it, we are the same Instead of, I'm good and you are the problem. You are the project. And we need to say, God, I'm going to put myself in your hands daily. And I, by faith, am going to put off the garbage and the list that he gives us. And by faith, I'm going to put on every day humility and gentleness and other-centered focus and a compassionate heart. And God will transform you minute by minute, day by day. There's a restoration class that's coming up, and we mentioned that in the, uh, in the intro video, and then on your outline, there's also, at Sutherland, there's a men's only group that's starting in September. There's an open group that's starting in January here, Green Campus, there's a group that's starting in September. And if you're feeling at a place where you've been broken and you really say, I need help, there is a process of going through this class where they walk through, it's many of the same things that are in this book, but it's a whole class where you walk through it. And that's really been helpful to a lot of people. And if you're watching online from around the world, uh, email us at info at familychurchweb.com and we can send you a link and help you get set up so you can take that online. I want to give you a couple of key charges, but before that, I want to hand off to Pastor Will. Uh, enjoy that green bean casserole, brother. <laughs> I want you to take a, 
moment and answer, what does this mean for me? What do I need to put off? Do we need this discussion? Do we need to work through this? Yeah. What is God speaking to you about right now? What kind of brokenness in you? Do you need to say, okay, yeah, I am broken. And in humility, take and say, God, I can't fix this myself. You have to heal me. You have to change my thinking. You have to change my attitudes. You have to change my actions. I want you just to take a minute. This isn't just a rhetorical question. Look at your paper there and say, God, what is it that I need to surrender right now? And write down something because everyone is broken. And then, of course, the second part of it is what I need to put on. And quite often, listen carefully, it's the opposite of what you are putting off. I need to get rid of the anxiety. I need to put on God's peace. I need to get rid of that resentment and bitterness. I need to put on God's forgiveness. I am losing the battle of lust. I need to put on the armor of God. I need that shield of faith to extinguish those fiery darts. Make it specific to you because you know what? All the truth in the world doesn't help you until you say this is where I am and this is what I need. And the Holy Spirit is there whispering in your ear saying this is where you are. Father, thank you for the hope that you give us of the beauty that can come in the brokenness that we experience. I thank you, Lord, in my own life for the freedom to to look back and to say, yeah, I'm a mess. I need the full power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to change me from a broken vessel to one that's been healed and the seams of gold now are bringing glory to you. And thank you, God, that we began this journey by faith and that we can continue it by faith. And I pray specifically for those who are feeling hopeless today that, God, you might give them the hope that someday they could have a story like Pam's, that all of those broken pieces could be united and that, God, you would be glorified and they could help other people. And, Father, for those of us who who have a tendency to say, well, I'm fine, help us to be honest about our brokenness and to let you do that miracle of healing that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.